Okay, well, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Leron back to Dublin, but only virtually, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully next year we'll be able to get you back in person. It would be nice to have people back. Edinburgh is so close that it's ridiculous not to be able to uh, meet in person anymore. And uh, we could have the hybrid version that way. Anyway, uh, Leron needs no introduction to this audience. He is going to tell us about on color, duality, and double copy. I hand it over to you, Laura. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Dendro, for the invitation. It's, it is very nice to be back in Dublin, although virtually only. And yes, it would be great to come visit at some point. Um, so I want to tell you today about some ongoing work with my colleagues um, from the Czech Republic, Edinburgh, and sorry, that's Branislav Yercho, Kunrock Kim. So, sorry to cut across you. There's an echo uh, on that, which will be in the recording if we can. So, oh, okay. I'm not sure where it's coming from. It's probably coming from the lecture theatre. Is it? Is it from me? I don't think so. It's, it's no, I imagine it's the lecture theatre. I think I can hear it myself. It will be rather annoying if we don't. Uh, well, probably it's as well to turn the microphone off in the lecture theatre. Okay, let's try again. Yes, so this is... Um ongoing work with Branislav Zhirko in the Czech Republic, uh, Hyunrok Kim and Christian Zeman in Edinburgh with myself. Uh, Christian, of course, is uh, also a Dias alumni. Uh, Tomaso Mercarelli, who's at ETH Zurich, and Martin Wolf from Surrey. And you could think of this uh, ongoing research program as having its origins in the almost trivial observation that the fundamental forces of nature are ostensibly described in two different mathematical frameworks. On the one hand, the electroweak and strong forces of the standard model are described by Yang Mills gauge theories. And on the other hand, we understand gravity as an artifact of the geometry of space time. And in this context, it's natural to think if there is some framework in which uh, these two descriptions become closer. Uh, bringing our descriptions of the fundamental forces closer in their mathematical character. An example being um, the geometrization of gauge theories through the kaluza klein mechanism. Turning that around, you could also ask for gravity to be reconstrued in some sense as a gauge theory. This is a venerable subject, and it, there are many realizations of this, this idea. Perhaps the conceptually most straightforward is to simply gauge the uh, Lorentz group, just to treat the Lorentz group as the gauge group of uh, a gauge theory. And indeed, in three dimensions, you can really make this uh, precise. It, uh, gravity is equivalent to a Chern-Simons gauge theory in three dimensions. A more uh, recent, subtle, and ultimately powerful point of view connecting gravity to gauge theories, of course, is the holographic principle con concretely realized through the ADS-CFT correspondence, where gravity in an asymptotically ADS uh, space-time is seen to be equivalent to a conformal field theory that lives on its boundary. But I want to appeal today to a third and at least superficially independent point of view. This is that gravity uh, can be reconstrued or reconceived as the product of two gauge theories. Now this idea itself has appeared time again in various guises, going back at least to the early work of Feynman and Papini, um, who were building on the straightforward observation that if you take two spin one representations of the Lorentz group and tensor them together, you get out a spin two representation, and you might think that this has something to do with gravity. But I'd say it was only really concretely made uh, significant with the advent of the KLT relations of string theory. In particular, the tree level closed string uh, amplitudes can be rewritten as sums of products of open string theory amplitudes. This idea itself 
was reinvigorated more recently by an observation by Bern Carrasco and Johansson uh, that it seems that the amplitudes of Yang Mills gauge theories have a remarkable property that goes by the name of color kinematics duality. This is roughly speaking that you can recast any amplitude, uh, any gluon amplitude in a form such that its color data, the, the, the relations obeyed by its color data, the data encoded in the gauge group, are pre precisely reflected by the relations amongst its kinematic data, the momentum and polarization of the gluons. Before you, before you go on, can, it, can you say what did Feynman and uh, um, Moring, Eagle, and Victor, what did these guys do? That seems to be the earliest reference. And, right, so, and, uh, so uh, as far as I'm aware, um, not too much. It was the idea that you could maybe con con construct a composite graviton out of two uh, spin one fields. Okay. Um, and of course, this runs into the obvious problems of the Witten-Weinberg theorem um, that, that forbids that essentially. So you realize that there must be some kind of more subtle incarnation of this idea of taking the product of spin one fields than just directly uh, tensoring them together. Remind us, what does the Witten-Weinberg uh, theorem actually say? It says that um, it, under the assumption that there is a Lorentz covariant uh, energy momentum, uh, conserved energy momentum tensor, uh, you can't have composite um, fields of spin greater than one. It, so it would rule out the graviton. That's okay. part of it. I mean, they say okay. more than that, but that's okay. the relevant part. Okay, very nice. So th yes, th this, this idea, this uh, Bern carrasco johansson color kinematics duality conjecture, not only does it suggest some kind of rather mysterious property of yang mills gauge theories themselves, that is somehow opaque in the Lagrangian starting point. Um, you know, it's not transparent why this property would ever be uh, true. But more than that, it also allows you to take a yang mills amplitude uh, and square it or double copy it into a gravitational amplitude, suggesting some deep relation between gravity and the product of gauge theories. However, even uh, in this context, there are some long-standing and rather obvious open questions. The first of which is, does color kinematics duality, at least in some appropriate sense, really hold to all orders? Is it actually true? And tied to this is the question of whether the double copy of the scattering amplitudes hold. Uh, is perturbative quantum uh, Einstein-Hilbert gravity coupled to a Calbremond and Dilaton really the square of yang mills theory? And finally, you might try to be more ambitious and ask, is this just the property of the S matrix? Or can you apply it to some more general observables or features of gravitational and gauge theory? Does this paradigm extend beyond the S matrix itself? And the point of view that I want to advocate today is that having discovered this color kinematics duality through the powerful on-shell uh, techniques developed in the amplitudes community, we can now step back off-shell and take a field theoretic point of view and try to understand where these things come from back at the level of the field theories. And the basic claim that I want to make today is that color kinematics duality is actually a property of the Yang Mills BV action, uh, with an important caveat that this is up to Jacobian counterterms that you have to include when you go to the loop level in the renormalized action. And schematically, uh, what I'm saying is that you can rewrite Yang, the Yang Mills BV action. Uh, or at least BRST action that I've presented here in a purely cubic form where the color kinematics duality becomes manifest. And I'll describe later what I mean by color kinematics duality being manifest in this action. And I'm gonna argue that this is a very natural way of thinking about color kinematics duality as a property of the action of yang mills theory. But I'm also gonna stress that this is a, in a sense a non-standard notion of color kinematics duality. It realizes it as an infinite dimensional symmetry of the BV action. And if one were to compute the loop amplitude integrands directly from the Feynman diagrams of this action, you would find color kinematic duality respecting loop integrands automatically. You don't have to do any work. However, and, and this is where I 
deviate from perhaps the standard notions of color kinematic duality, it will be anomalous. These Jacobian counterterms I mentioned may break the color kinematic duality of the loop integrands derived from the Feynman rules directly. And this has an important implication, and that is that the generalized unitarity proof that takes color kinematic duality conjecture and that takes the color kinematic duality conjecture and uses it to establish that the double copy of the Yang Mills amplitudes, the gluon amplitudes, give you good uh, graviton amplitudes, doesn't straightforwardly apply. Instead, it's replaced by a notion of double copying the action itself. And it seemed to be manifestly invalid. Um, and this replaces that missing proof and assures us that the double copy of the amplitudes is consistent to all loop orders, allowing us to establish for the first time that perturbative quantum Einstein-Hilbert gravity coupled to a Calbremont two-form and Dilaton really is the square of yang mills theory, at least perturbatively. You, what you wrote looks more, more like a Chern Simons action. So how are we supposed to read it? So, it, I mean, it, it differs from a Chern Simons action in the fact that I've got a box operator here. And box means? Box is the Dell inversion. In flat space. In flat space, yes. This is all, uh, okay. until my very last slide, everything I'm going to say is uh, flat space perturbation theory. Well, when I think of Yang Mills, I think of a four. Uh, a term. Yes, and I'm going to elaborate in great detail on why I don't have that. Okay. Um, that's a very important observation, and the fact that my action doesn't have it, it is a big part of this story, so it's a good question, and it's a question I will address at length. You'll probably be sick of the answer by the end of this. Um, okay, the other thing that recasting Yang Mills theory in this uh, purely cubic form, and maybe I can mention now, that what this immediately looks like is a biojoint scalar theory, where I've got the structure constants from one gauge group and the structure constants from some other gauge group. And that's perhaps the best uh, picture to have in mind at this stage. And having recast it in this form, we learn something uh, about the mathematical properties of Yang Mills that wasn't immediately transparent. And this is the idea that what color kinematics duality is mathematically is best expressed in terms of a homotopy algebra. Now, to give you some intuition of what's going on here, the first observation uh, I need to make is that every BV quantized Lagrangian field theory, Yang Mills included, corresponds to a homotopy Lie algebra or an L infinity algebra. And in this particular case, this L infinity algebra factorizes. So it has a color piece which corresponds to the gauge group. It has a kinematic piece, which roughly speaking corresponds to the Lorentz and uh, the Poincare representations carried by the fields. So it's a representation space. And a scalar piece, which is roughly speaking the uh, a, a associative commutative algebra of scalar fields. And this recasting in this color kinematic duality manifesting form tells us that this kinematic and scalar piece combine into what you might call a BV box infinity algebra, which is a very particular type of homotopy algebra. And we learn that what color kinematics duality is, is the homotopy relations of this, of this homotopy algebra. So the, what are called the kinematic Jacobi identities, the relations amongst the kinematic objects that build the amplitudes that mirror the color Jacobi relations actually correspond to homotopy relations in some homotopy algebra. Um, a possible uh, corollary to all of this is in, in this version of color kinematics duality, I only ever really need to solve things at tree level. And, the, and when I say solve things, I mean, I really mean in this homotopy context, satisfy the axioms of this homotopy algebra. And these two observations together point to a pot potential dramatic computational speed up in the applications of the double copy, which I'll, I haven't told you what the applications are, but I'll, I'll, I'll spend some time on that. Okay, so having given that kind of lightning overview, which I don't expect to be particularly illuminating, I'm gonna make all of these points much clearer as we go. Let me tell you uh, what, what's coming up. I'm gonna begin with a quick review 
of uh, color kinematics duality in the double copy so that everyone has some idea of what I'm talking about. Then I'm going to revisit color kinematics duality and argue that it can be made a property of the BV action of yang mills theory. And then this is going to allow me to uh, consider some Lagrangian uh, syngamy, where I'm invoking the idea of the uh, meiotic reproduction of diploid uh, cells, because this double copy of action, uh, the, the, the double copy action really has this neat analogy with this biological reproductive system that I'll explain later. I'll briefly talk about some generalizations about beyond Yang Mills theory, and hopefully I have time to tell you about the homotopy algebra is underpinning all of this. Okay, so onto the background. Now, the first observation I need to make when I talk about color kinematics duality is the idea that I can rewrite any endpoint L loop gluon amplitude purely in terms of only cubic diagrams. So here's uh, my endpoint L loop Yang Mills amplitude, and it's built out of three pieces, a color factor, this CI, a kinematic factor, the NI, and some propagator uh, denominators, the DIs, where this index I runs over all cubic diagrams. So at four points, we'd have the familiar S, T, and U channel diagrams, but we won't include any four-point contact term that would come from the quartic interaction that you're familiar with from the standard uh, formulation of Yang Mills theory. And I want to say just a little more about what these factors are. So the first piece are the color numerators or color factors, and these are built purely from the gauge group structure constants. And they are just determined by the topology of the associated diagram. So you can just read them off the diagram. So for instance, in the S channel, where if I put external um, color indices A, B, C, D around the edge, the corresponding uh, color factor is just given by this combination. And I've got the analogous ones for the T and U channel. And if you sum them all up, they'll equal zero, and it's just the Jacobi identity. So this S, T, and U channel is just a diagrammatic representation of the Jacobi identity. Then I've got the uh, propagators, and I'm, I'm going to stick to Feynman gauge. So the propagators are always just the products of the momentum squared of the internal lines. So for S, T, and U, it's the, the familiar Mandelstam variables. And finally, there is this kinematic numerator. And whereas the color factors and propagators were completely determined by the topology of the associated diagram, these kinematic numerators are not unique. Um, they are built from the momenta and polarization uh, tensors associated to the gluons, including the internal loop momenta. Um, and there are many ways you can massage these to take different forms. And this ability, this freedom is what makes, what allows color kinematics duality to be possible. Okay, so I maybe just want to give you some intuition as to why we can always rewrite the amplitude in terms of purely cubic diagrams. And it's quite a simple intuition. Imagine some Feynman diagram and deep buried inside it, you've got one of your four point contact terms. I can blow this four-point contact term up into a sum of three Feynman diagrams, which are identical except in this four-point sub-diagram, where they're replaced by the S, T, and U channel. And I do this just by inserting the propagator over the propagator in the three corresponding ways, and I could just always do this. So I can always reduce something that involves both cubic uh, diagrams uh, 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 both uh, cubic vertices and quartic vertices to something that just involves uh, cubic vertices. You can also realize this directly in the Yang Mills Lagrangian through the introduction of an auxiliary field. So I can blow up the quartic term, this is addressing Denjo's question, um, by introducing some auxiliary field, B, uh, which replaces the quartic interaction with some cubic interaction in such a way that it, the effect that it has is it just blows up these cortic, uh, uh, these cortic vertices into sums of cubic vertices in the way I just described. And the advantage of doing this, one doesn't need to, but the presentational advantage of doing this is that the Feynman diagrams then give you these cube, the, uh, give you a cubic formulation of the amplitudes directly. 
And I just want to make one uh, caveat clear is that when I talk about these kinematic numerators, I have to sum over all species of fields that can run in the internal line. So, so in the four point S channel diagram, the total kinematic numerator NS will be given by a contribution where the gluon field runs in the internal line and a contribution where the auxiliary field runs in the internal line. And of course, this makes sense because the C's and the D's are determined just by the topology of the diagram. They, they're, they're the same for any diagram that has the same topology. So I can always just factor them out and bunch together all the kinematic numerators corresponding to all the species of fields. Now, having told you that I can re-express all the amplitudes in, in terms of sums over purely cubic diagrams, I can state what the color kinematics, uh, the color kinematics duality conjecture is. It, the claim is that there is a reorganization of the endpoint L loop gluon amplitude once it's been written in this purely cubic form, such that whenever the kinematic factors obey some Jacobi identity, which is their job, it's their raison d'etre. They obey Jacobi identities all over the shop. The kinematic numerator- Just, is, just uh, before you go on, uh, on the previous slide, I just wanted to understand, have you been forced to uh, fix the gauge for this? Yes, so th this, okay. is all, this is all gauge fixed. Um, uh, I've, you know, I've, I've got, if you like, you can have in mind that I'm doing gauge fixing, and now I'm doing uh, my 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 uh, computing amplitudes in that picture. Here I've picked five and gauge. It's yeah, the most okay. convenient for all of these calculations. You can, with a great deal of unnecessary effort, uh, consider other gauges. Um, but it, it just complicates things. There's, there's no. Uh, it, 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 yeah. Uh, okay. let, let me not say more than that. Sure. One cert can certainly go to other gauges, but it you mean you carry around a lot of extra baggage in doing that. What so, happens to spinner fields? What happens to Dirac? So I will come to Dirac. Um, there, yes, I, I, if you don't mind, I'll come address that at some other point. The short story is, if you have an, let me tell you the short story now. The short story is, if you want to couple in a joint valued Dirac field, then it has to be supersymmetrically coupled. If you want to, uh, if you want to couple uh, spinner fields in some other representations, the fundamental, say, then there is a different organizational principle at, at play. The Jacobi identity that I'm hinging everything on here is replaced by the commutation relation. But in a way, this is not really different. It's just, you know, the Jacobi identity is the commutation relation in the adjoint representation. So I'm not really doing anything fundamentally distinct. But what happens is that in the, eventually when I tell you about how the double copy works, whenever you have fundamental fields, they don't double copy with a joint field and the, the two worlds kind of separate. And there's, there's a uh, good reason for that. The, the quick intuition is that if you double copied fermions with gluons where you're allowed to have arbitrary uh, matter multiplets uh, that are in the fundamental uh, representation, you could generate through the double copy arbitrary uh, gravitini, and we know you can't couple in an interacting theory arbitrary uh, numbers of gravitini. So something must go wrong, and basically it just doesn't work. Um, you, you need supersymmetry if you want to get gravitini out. Um, okay, so let me just restate what the color kinematics duality conjecture was, or it is. It's a statement that whenever the uh, color factors satisfy a Jacobi identity, as they will, then the kinematic factors um, satisfy precisely the same identity. And this is highly non-trivial. It's highly non-obvious. At four points, once you blow up the four-point vertex, it actually happens automatically with the Feynman diagrams. But beyond four points, uh, it, it won't. Your five, you know, doing things with Feynman diagrams is not sufficient. You have to be cleverer to get it to be manifest. Nonetheless, it's been established at tree level. So if I drop the, if I set L equals to zero, then the color kinematics duality conjecture is not a conjecture, it's a theorem. Um, at the loop level, there is significant evidence up to four loops in various super young males theories but it quickly becomes very difficult to check. And indeed, it remains conjectural at the loop level. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Are, from what you wrote earlier, looks like 
uh, object with three indices. Okay. Do they fulfill the appropriate anti-symmetry so that this also defines a Lie algebra? Yes, so th th that's right. There's, there's, I've, I've put that here. So, but, but remember, these CEIs are composed of uh, polynomials of the gauge group structure constants. Yes. And whenever I turn, whenever I exchange two edges, two legs in a Feynman diagram, that's, if that flips two indices in one of these uh, structure constants, I'm going to pick up a sign. So I will pick up a sign under exchanging legs in the Feynman diagrams. And uh, I'm demanding that the same is true of these NIs. But remember these NIs, um, th 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 this I here is uh, an indexing the cubic diagrams. So you yeah. could think of four points, it would run over ST and U for the ST and U channel. And these NIs are composed, they're polynomials in the moment, they're Lorentz invariant polynomials in the momenta and polarization tensors. Um, so they don't have a three index, they don't have a natural three index structure automatically, but we are going to give them precisely that. That's going to be one of our jobs. Does that mean that the NIs also define a compact Lie algebra? Or no. Um, they're, they're going to be an infinite, it, when we get to the end of the story, they're going to be an infinite dimensional uh, Lie algebra. So, um, and certainly not compact. Um, okay. Okay. Um, uh, but what's crucial, it, this will become much clearer later, is the Jacobi identity. That's what really is going to make all of these constructions tick. Um, okay, so now having told you what the color kinematics duality conjecture is, I can tell you what the double copy prescription is. And the idea is that if I'm given a color kinematics duality satisfying representation of some amplitude for gluons, so let's assume I've managed to massage the kinematic numerators into a form such that they obey the Jacobi, a kinematic Jacobi identity whenever the CIs obey a color Jacobi identity. Then I can do this simple operation of just replacing these color factors with a second copy of the kinematic factors and out pops a genuine amplitude of um, Einstein-Hilbert gravity coupled to a dilaton and a Calbermont two form which for brevity's sake, I will call n equals zero supergravity. It's the uh, common sector of closed string theory in the, in the low energy effective field theory limit. But, but um, I'm a little bit, it suggests that you can reduce this to a cubic interaction. Yes, indeed. Uh, but it, it has much higher than, quad, than quartic that's right. Perturbative uh, Einstein-Hilbert has all order interactions. So you are presumably going to involve an enormous number of additional fields. Spot on. Okay. All right. Can I ask one more question? I mean, the Jacobi identity comes from the associativity of the Lie group products. Okay. Mm. So what happens here? I mean, these ends are fulfilling some kind of Jacobi identity. Does it say something about the, an underlying associative algebra? Or what's it? That's a very good question. Uh, if you're asking for some, uh, you know, uh, in inverted commas, integration of the of this Lie algebra into some group, uh, it's not something we've considered. I, I um, whether this kinematic Lie algebra corresponds to some group. That's a, that's a good question. I can answer it in some very limited circumstances. Uh, in the general case, I don't have a good answer for you. So work by um, Ricardo uh, Montero and Donald O'Connell, they showed that if you restrict your attention to the south dual sector of Yang Mills, there is a kinematic algebra that associated to Yang Mills theory, roughly along the lines of what I'm telling you now, um, that corresponds to area preserving diffeomorphisms. Um, that's the closest I can get to what you're looking for. Um, and I don't have a, a generic answer to that question. Does that um, go beyond two dimensions? Because I, you I expect the area preserving ones in two dimensions, but not higher. It's, it's because we're, we're uh, restricting to the south dual sector 
and effectively you're looking oh, you're at effectively, yeah 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 okay you talked about homotopy algebras yes uh, homotopy there is a homotopy group okay and one can look at the group algebra of a homotopy group homotopy group for any fixed n pi n n fixed okay or look at the uh, group generated by all the pi the free group generated by all the pi is yes, that the, this is this is um this is uh the, so the, the the idea that you can take a homotopy algebra so uh, the, the, we're using two slightly different terms you're, you're referring to the Lie algebra of the pi groups and when the I say Lee homotopy algebra, algebra I mean a homotopy relaxation of an algebra the group and, algebra I mean if you give me a group I mm -hmm. can immediately uh, extend sure. it to yeah yes. an algebra over complex some underlying field c let us say okay sure uh, I thought that was what meant the meaning of homotopy algebras was no um it could be related but uh that that's not what i mean by the term i i will i will address uh, more precisely what i okay. what i mean by that when i uh, come to it the, 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 so the um yes i mean the, the, let me not give the short story now i'll give the proper story when we come to that point because i think it's more coherent to to, to try explain it uh, in, in one in one go rather than give you fragments now if you don't mind okay um Okay, so this the fact that you get, uh, if you assume that color kinematics duality holds, that you get that and you get gravitons for free. You know, given a gluon amplitude, no extra calculation is needed to compute the graviton amplitude. And this suggests some deep connection between uh, gauge theories and gravity. And it's also computationally very powerful. Uh, it's made tractable. Um, previously inconceivable calculations. So, for example, it's been used to show that uh, n equals 8 supergravity is finite to five loops. Um, and this itself is rather interesting. Uh, if you uh, had your uh, supergravity 1980s hat on, you would be shocked by this statement. You might naively expect divergences to appear at least at three loops. But actually, uh, it's a little disappointing because you can explain the, the finiteness of five loops by supersymmetry and the E7 global symmetries of n equals eight supergravity. And really, you have to go all the way to seven loops before any cancellations of the divergences can't be explained away by known symmetry principles. However, if you drop the degree of supersymmetry, so consider, for example, n equals five supergravity, your protection against divergences fails at lower loop order. And indeed, it's been shown using the double copy that, super, that n equals five supergravity is finite at four loops, contrary to all expectations based on symmetry arguments. And for this reason, these cancellations that are uh, killing these divergences have been dubbed uh, enhanced cancellations. We, we don't have a good handle on their origin, why they work, but the intuition is it has something to do with color kinematics duality coupled with supersymmetry and R symmetry. Um, ultimately, the implications of these statements remain a little unclear, although it's tempting to speculate tentatively that perhaps these enhanced cancellations are powerful enough for a finite perturbative quantum field theory of gravity. But the jury is certainly out. I've got nothing definitive to say about that. Just n equals five. Does it? Does that come from reduction from something simpler in higher dimensions, like uh, n equals eight is coming from eleven dimensional? So can you n equals five just so I can understand it a little better? Um, so n equals five from a dimensional reduction point of view. Uh, the, the, the quickest way to do it is to do uh, is to do one of these asymmetric orbifold reductions. So you, you you could you could put it on a torus and then you orbifold some of the R symmetries. Forget the twisted sectors and you land up with pure n equals five supergravity. That's the most straightforward geometric derivation, okay. I think. Um, starting from eleven dimensional. Starting from eleven yeah. or okay. ten, you know, wh yeah. whatever, however you prefer to think about yeah. it. Okay. Um, the other way to ob the the other way to obtain it, of course, is to if n equals eight is n equals four Yang mills times n equals four Yang mills, and n equals five is n equals four Yang mills times n equals one Yang mills in this double copy point of view. 
Um, and that's exactly the way it's been uh, used to do these calculations here. Okay, now, uh, given these, uh, well, that, so this is just one kind of application, probing the UV properties of perturbative uh, theories of quantum gravity. Um, but you might consider more general uh, applications, and uh, these are perhaps more surprising. So there is a rapidly growing field applying uh, techniques from amplitudes and the double copy to pushing the precision frontier of modeling uh, black hole collisions in the cotton text, say, of gravity wave astronomy. And they've really managed to go in, in you know, in the, in the, for the correct regime and for the correct observables to go beyond the state of the art using these ideas. And you can also, uh, in particular circumstances, double copy non-perturbative classical solutions, in particular when you're um, solutions take a Kerr shield form, then there is a Yang, there is a solution to Yang Mills theory that double copies into that solution non perturbatively. There are stringy applications, and this allows one, for example, to extend these ideas to non trivial gluon and space time backgrounds using an ambi twister string point of view. And there are rather surprising applications where, where these perturbative statements I've been making really should have no sway. For example, understanding the gauge structure of the conjectured 4,0 phase of M theory, or in identifying uh, twin non-Lagrangian, non-perturbative S-fold theories, which, um, and the sense in which they're twin is that they have the same uh, bosonic, their, their, their bosonic sectors are identical, but they have distinct fermionic uh, supersymmetric completions. And this was previously thought to be impossible for rigid supersymmetry, but in fact, you can use the double copy to discover examples of these theories. Okay, so this, is, uh, this was kind of the uh, background on the uh, double copy color kinematics duality and some of their applications. And now I want to uh, return to the idea that having discovered these amplitude identities, that we can really go back to the BST Lagrangian field theory and consider a Lagrangian double copy. And there are two key ideas that enter into this. The first is that you can manifest this color kinematics duality in the actions. When you first encounter color kinematics duality, it's completely mysterious from the point of view of the standard Yang Mills action. But in fact, you can make parts of it manifest in the action. And associated to this, there are these kinematic algebras that I've been hinting at. And the second idea is that if one wants to consider the field theory, one should really do it for the full BRST complex. This allows one to uh, double copy the Lagrangian in a sensible way. So just as an example of um, why this idea, of how this idea can be used, uh, there is in fact a covariant uh, color kinematics duality manifesting uh, formulation of the Yang Mills Lagrangian, which allows one to find analytic expressions for all tree level BCJ numerators. The BCJ numerators are these kinematic factors when they satisfy the kinematic uh, Jacobi identities. So it's a beautiful tool for generating these objects efficiently. But today what I want to say is that the Yang Mills BV action admits a natural form of anomalous color kinematics duality that immediately implies the double copy to all orders. So let me give you a lightning view over this. The first step is to recast the Yang Mills uh, BRST action in a cubic form such that color kinematics duality is manifested off shell and for the entire BRST complex. Having done that, the double copy becomes transparent. I just take these color pieces and directly replace them with second copies of these kinematic pieces. And I'll make it a little more clear what all of these things are later. When one does this, it automatically induces a double copy of the BRST operator. So out of the Yang Mills, out of the two Yang Mills BRST operators, one for the left theory and one for the right theory, out comes a double copy BRST operator that's composed of diffeos and two form gauge symmetries in this case, corresponding to the diffeomorphisms of general relativity and the two form gauge symmetries of the Kalbermann two form. And then if we assume that we have tree level physical color kinematics duality, which remember is no longer a conjecture that's proven, then perturbative quantum equivalence follows. 
So I have that this double copy Q is nil quadratic, annihilates the double copy action. And this sets up a quantum equivalence between the double copy action and the standard BRST quantized N equals zero supergravity action. And the corollary to all of this is that the loop amplitude integrands computed from the Feynman diagrams of this object manifest color kinematic duality. They're automatically color kinematic dual. As I mentioned, up to this important caveat that counterterms are needed for unitarity. And their double copy correctly gives the amplitudes of n equals zero supergravity. So it's, it's, a, it's an alternative route into proving that the double copy really works. So what do you mean? Sorry. No, that's okay. So what do you mean specifically by up to counter terms things for? Yes, so um, I, I will address this in detail, but basically okay, in, some in, step, in, in some step in the process, I'm going to need to make non-local field redefinitions ah. that introduce Jacobian determinants that are, don't go to zero under dimensional regularization. They live there and they are needed to kill spurious poles that you would otherwise have. So if you just take the loop integrands as they come uh, and you... Uh, you know, cut and put them on the uh, unitarity cuts, you would find that you would have auxiliary fields propagating on the external edges of the tree diagrams. All the tree amplitudes come out on the nose, no problem. And those counter terms are just killing those uh, spurious modes. Okay. Can I ask a question now? Okay. Yes. Related to your step three, I was, I had uh, noted the issue. See, in the Yangman's case, if one makes a gauge transformation, one sees that the loop order is preserved. Okay, so uh, the loop uh, particular number of loops that is invariant under the gauge transformations, uh, which you can implement because uh, okay, then in doing calculations if I know correctly, one has to group them into gauge invariant uh, sets to maintain gauge invariance even in the Feynman gauge. Okay, now I don't know when is the result for diffuse. Do they preserve loops? Why should they preserve loops? What is the meaning of diffuse acting on grass? Uh, well, I'm not. I'm, I'm just going to consider diffuse at the level of the action directly. Uh, th th this is not a statement about the, uh, the the Q operator acting on the amplitudes. There will be in the, the amplitudes will have residual uh, diffeomorphism invariants, but of course, I mean. Th th the amplitude are manifestly gauge invariant objects. Um, but how about diffuse? Diffuse mix up all kinds of orders. At least in the action, they mix up all kinds of things. But the so, but the S matrix is gauge invariant nonetheless. No, I am talking about diffuse. Okay? So there is a problem in defining gauge in okay. diffuse. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I, I perhaps see where I perhaps see where the, 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 the I'm really using shorthand here for the um, when I say diffio, I'm talking about the residual gauge transformations once one has uh, done the perturbative expansion around Minkowski space time. Okay. Um, yes, this is this is really shorthand for for, for that, but. Okay. Um, you know, you can perturbatively order by order reconstruct the full diffeomorphisms uh, from these uh, these objects, um, but then there will still be diffeomorphisms that correspond to uh, background transformations, which are not included amongst these. Okay, so let me first uh, the next section I'm going to address point one, and this is where the majority of the hard work is done. So the first. The, the first task in uh, boosting color kinematics duality from a statement about the uh, diagrams of amplitudes to some property of the actions is to make the uh, physical tree level color kinematics duality manifest in the action. And the way one does this is by adding an infinite tower of higher point interactions. So I mentioned so, so you can think of this is this is it, it, the Yang Mills action in Feynman gauge roughly was represented. I've got the kinetic term, the cubic interaction, the quartic interaction where I insert box over box in a particular way. And then I want to add uh, higher vertices. And the job of these higher vertices is that whenever the uh, kinematic Jacobi identity, I've illustrated one here. So here's a five point 
uh, kinematic Jacobi identity that I want to hold, the sum of these three diagrams uh, should give zero. The color factors uh, trivially give zero because the uh, polynomials in the Fs of the S, T, and U four-point subdiagrams, they can just factor them out and they sum to zero. And the kinematic numerators have to satisfy the same identity, and that's less trivial. Now, th the idea is that this will fail if you just compute with the Feynman diagrams, but I can insert a new vertex that corrects that failure. And you might worry if I'm just adding vertices that I might be changing the theory. But the point is that every vertex you add is actually identically zero. It comes with a prefactor that is just the Jacobi identity uh, of the uh, gauge group structure constants, zero by the Jacobi identity. But the point is you can take each of the terms in this Jacobi identity and you can spread these zeros around. You can break up this zero into a sum of pieces and spread it around in such a way that it manipulates these kinematic numerators so that they satisfy the color kinematics duality, uh, the kinematic Jacobi identities. This was first observed by Zvi Bern and colleagues up to eight points, and it was shown to be possible by Telotti and Weinziel to all orders. And the, the key argument is that you first have to prove that tree level color kinematics duality holds for the physical S matrix. Once you have that, then you can run their arguments. Um, okay, so that's all very good, but uh, we can go a step further and we can, in our language, strictify this. So these higher point terms are reduced to purely cubic interactions by introducing more and more auxiliary fields. So I've got my four points auxiliary field and I can add in auxiliary fields that reduce this five point interaction to a cubic interaction. And in the end, everything is just cubic. I didn't really need to do this, but it's helpful to think in terms of purely cubic objects. And then I get purely cubic Feynman diagrams, such that at tree level for the physical S matrix, I get the color kinematics duality satisfied automatically. I just compute with Feynman diagrams. However, this does not imply loop level color kinematics duality. If I were to glue these trees together, um, I'd need to put in the unphysical off-shell modes propagating in the loops. I'd have to have ghosts and uh, longitudinal gluons and what have you. And I don't have that. So there's an obvious intuition to lift to loop level, to lift this statement away from tree level to loop level, we should include these off-shell unphysical ghost modes uh, in the external states and boost and, and, and prove color kinematics duality for tree level S matrix where I do the heretical thing of allowing these unphysical modes to live on the external lines of my uh, interaction vertices. And then we can glue them together to make trees. And the fact that we can do this really corresponds to three uh, related observations. The first is that if I want to put longitudinal gluons on the external lines and still satisfy color kinematics duality, this really corresponds to a gauge choice. Of course, if I put longitudinal gluons on the external lines of the S matrix, it's no longer gauge invariant. This is not a good observable. And changing your gauge choice changes this object. And it changes it in such a way that you get color kinematics duality for longitudinal gluons. The ghosts then essentially follow for, for free by the BRST ward identities. And finally, I want to uh, relax the fact that these gluons and ghosts are on shell to be off shell. And this is the part that requires these non-local field redefinitions, which are invisible on shell, but are important off shell. And these induce these Jacobian count, uh, counter terms that are required to cancel the spurious poles. So let's just do step one. The, I'm going to re relax the transversality of the external gluons, i.e. these polarization tensors are no longer transverse. And then tree level color kinematics duality fails. Uh, you know, I've, I've managed to recast my action so that I have tree level color kinematics duality for transverse gluons, but if I relax that condition, it now starts failing all over the shop. But by analogy with the Telotti Weinzel mechanism, I can always compensate this by introducing higher point vertices. Uh oh. Uh, I've <laughs> I'm sorry, I've missed out a diagram here. Um, okay, so the important point is that these vertices are now necessarily non-zero. So the picture to that's meant to go there is something very analogous to this. But unlike this case, it doesn't have a prefactor that is zero. 
they're necessarily non-zero. But we can still add them to the action without changing any of the physics. And this essentially follows from the observation that, the, uh, that these color kinematics duality failures can always be simultaneously compensated by adding vertices to the action of this form. And the reason it's of this form is because these terms have to drop out when I make the gluons uh, longitudinal. They, they must be zero when the gluons are transverse. Sorry, transverse. So they always take this form. And I can always introduce them by just shifting my gauge fixing function on. So if I have some uh, Lorenz-like gauge here, I just shift it with this uh, function of the gluon field here. And I do a corresponding shift of the Nakanishi Lautrop field. So the point is that longitudinal color kinematics duality just corresponds to a gauge choice. It's just a special gauge choice. Now, to get the color kinematics duality for the ghosts, I'm then going to use the on mass shell BST ward identities. So recall, on the physical states, they're just annihilated. But the uh, unphysical forwards and backwards polarized gluons, or equivalently the Nakanishi Lautrop field, are just related to the ghost and anti ghost. And this gives me um, BRST ward identities that transfer uh, amplitudes in inverted commas with forward polarized and backward polarized gluons to ghost to anti ghost amplitudes. And in doing this, you actually transfer the color kinematics duality of these. Um, pseudo amplitudes into the color kinematics duality of these pseudo amplitudes. And the, the result in the end is exactly what it had to be. You have to add the term, you have to add the ghost sector that would be given by the BRST operator at, acting on this new uh, gauge fixing uh, term. So you, the thing that you had to do for BRST invariance is the thing that you are told to do for color kinematics duality. The two go hand in hand. And then I could do this trick once again. So these, these uh, I didn't have the picture, but they're, they're at all orders. You do it order by order. And at all orders, I can reduce this to a ever increasing set of auxiliary fields. So here's an example uh, up to four points where I've got some auxiliary fields that are implementing color kinematics duality for the longitudinal gluons. And then I've got their BRST completion into this ghost sector. And once again, the cubic Feynman diagrams yield tree level uh, color kinematic dual amplitudes for the physical gluons, but also the unphysical longitudinal modes and ghosts. Everything on shell. So um, I'm imposing momentum squared equals zero everywhere here. And this is the final thing we'd like to relax. And this is a completely analogous story. If I relaxed from on shell to off shell, I get color kinematics duality violations of this form. Uh, for each external momentum. And we can always compensate them with terms of this form through some possibly non-local field redefinitions uh, of this form. So if I consider the kinetic term for some fields, these could be the ghost anti ghost pair, for example, or it could be the gluons, then um, I just produce these vertices in this manner. And then we have this claim that we have off shell tree level BRST color kinematics duality manifest. And this implies loop level color kinematics duality for the amplitude integrands up to these counter terms. And as I said, the price to pay here is the Jacobian determinants, which induce these counter terms ensuring unitarity. And in this sense, uh, we have manifest loop level color kinematic duality, but it's anomalous on the physical Hilbert space when I restrict a physical external state. But actually, if I allowed the spurious, if I consider the full pre hilbert states that contain, contains all the states of the auxiliary fields, then it's an exact symmetry. But of course, that's not what we're after. Okay, and the, the, the summary, let me just summarize everything that we've done uh, through this process, is that we get a perfect off-shell BRST Lagrangian color kinematics duality. By doing all of these operations, I get a cubic, uh, Young Mills action, uh, BV action. I haven't told you the BV part of the story, but it's it's uh, what, having done all of that work, it's rather trivial to extend it to the BV action. But you could just think of the BRST action where I eliminate the antifields through the gauge fixing fermion. Um, having done that, I get this BV action that manifests color kinematics duality. 
And I should emphasize now that this AI uh, field is really an infinite tower of fields where I've got the uh, Yang Mills potential, the Nakanishi Laotrop fields, the anti ghosts, ghosts, and then this infinite tower of auxiliary fields that I had to introduce to make everything cubic. These C's and F's are the usual Cartan killing form and structure constants. Do of you have colors. ghosts for ghosts as well? Um, you have ghost auxiliaries, but there are no ghosts for ghosts. Yeah, no. um, so, yes, I mean, you could introduce ghosts for ghosts um, if you wanted to try introduce auxiliary. So, you know, if you have a BST operator acting on some auxiliary ghosts, it will typically be something uh, of higher than cubic, higher than quadratic order in the ghosts, um, in the in the fields, and you might want to make that thing quadratic again and introduce further auxiliary auxiliary fields, and then effectively you have ghosts for ghosts. But really, you should think of there only being the ghost and the anti ghost, and all of these auxiliary fields are really um, multiple copies of these ghosts in collinear limits, if you like. So the, the important point is that these, uh, these objects, the, the, the blue capital C and capital F are differential operators now that satisfy precisely the same identities as the uh, Cartan killing form and structure constants of the Lie group as operator equations. So I've just written them down here. So I've got the Jacobi identity, the fact that um, the metric is left invariant uh, that, that, that they're anti-symmetric and, and the metric is symmetric. Um, and the whole purpose of everything that I've just been doing is to bring these differential operators into this form. And that's what we've achieved. Now, some comments. This action has manifest color kinematics duality because these uh, kinematic numerators manifestly obey the same identities as the uh, color structure constants. So if you think about computing with the Feynman diagrams, the Feynman diagrams are going to be completely democratic in the, in the two sets of Fs, and they will manifestly uh, be color kinematic uh, dual. And these Fs are structure constants of some infinite dimensional kinematic Lie algebra that mirrors the usual color uh, structure constants. And the corollary that I've emphasized that the loop amplitude integrands are automatically color kinematic dual, but they're anomalous in a controlled manner due to these Jacobian counterterms. And this is really a shift in point of view. Rather than thinking of uh, a non-anomalous color kinematic duality at loop level, I'm exchanging this for a consistent field theory formulation of color kinematic duality, which generates uh, loop amplitudes where the color kinematic duality becomes anomalous, uh, and this is a departure from the standard expressions of loop level color kinematics duality. We have satisfied all the usual conditions, except we've dropped generalized unitarity due to these counter terms. But this latter thing is re replaced with the off shell color kinematics duality of the BV action. And this provides an alternative route to proving that the double copy works. So now that I've said that, and I'm uh, realizing I'm coming towards the end of my time. I, uh, I we, are, we are relaxed about time. We, we like to ask lots of questions and uh, let the seminar okay. continue to its natural end. Well, so if at any stage continue. you feel like I'm uh, abusing uh, your generosity with the time, then just let me know. I can, you know, I can, I, there are various places I can truncate the story. You know, there's no rush. So, so I've got to this stage where I want to, where I want to convince you now that this off-shell color kinematics duality of the BV action is really all I needed to make sense of the double copy. So let me just take a step back for the moment and talk in generality what you might mean by double copying uh, 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 field theories. So the picture I want to have in mind is that I have two parent theories that have been rewritten in some cubic form. If you like, you can think of this as just introducing enough auxiliary fields to reduce all the higher order interactions to be purely cubic. So this could be Einstein, perturbative Einstein-Hilbert gravity, if you want. You'd have an infinite tower of auxiliary fields. And I'll consider two parent theories, 
the left theory and the right theory. And then I want to factorize these theories. So I'm going to demand that these Fs and Cs admit some factorized form, but I'm not going to be particularly prejudiced about what this factorization means. I don't mean for you to have in mind that these are, this is the Cartan killing form, and this is the uh, structure constants of some Lie group. They are what they are. I'm not being specific about it, but there is some factorized form for both of these theories. And then what this syngamy of uh, Lagrangians means is to take uh, one half of one of these theories and combine it with one half of the other theory. And obviously I can do this in four possible ways. I can take uh, the blue structure constants uh, from this left theory and combine them with the blue structure constants of this right theory, structure constants in, in a generalized sense, and take the tensor product of the blue factor of the field space with the blue factor of the field space to get me this uh, daughter theory in the top where everything is blue. And this is, this is typically the double copy theory. If, 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 I was, if this was Yang Mills and these really were the color structure constants and these were the kinematic structure constants, then this would be the double copy. And right at the other end, I'd get the, what's sometimes called the zero of copy. I just really replacing all the kinematic pieces with color. And this is now just a, bio, a plain old cubic biojoint scalar theory. And I can do these things in between as well. But these could be gravity theories. I could have, both of these factors could have been kinematic factors. And then I'd be turning one gravity theory into some other gravity theory through this process. Um, or they could be both be biojoint scalar theories, and then I'd just be getting out other biojoint scalar theories. There are many things you could uh, consider in this general picture. So that's the kind of very general notion of what I mean by syngomatic reproduction of factorizable theories. Um, and the specific example, of course, is the case where both the left and right theories are Yang Mills. And the claim is in this case, when I do this uh, uh, prescription, I get out n equals zero supergravity. So I take this uh, field, uh, this multiplet of fields that contains the, the, the gluon field and all the ghosts and auxiliaries, and I simply replace its color index with another copy of the kinematic index, and out comes the fields of n equals zero supergravity plus their ghosts and auxiliaries. And the claim is that this action, when I perform this procedure, gives me uh, the double copy action, which is equivalent to n equals zero supergravity. Of course, if I went the other way, as I said, I get this biojoint scalar theory. Now, in that story, there was no mention of color kinematics duality, and you should be rightly worried that this is overly general. How do I know that this is anything sensible at all? How do I know it's a good theory? In particular, bear in mind that this is supposed to be the BRST gauge fix theory. How do I know it's a good BRST gauge fixing? What guarantees that this is anything sensible? We should certainly see color kinematics duality enter the story. And it should be crucial to showing that this double copy Lagrangian is really equivalent to the thing we're claiming it is. Now, the semi-classical equivalence almost follows directly by construction. Uh, if you assume that you have on-shell tree-level color kinematics duality for the physical gluons, this replacement is essentially just doing the tree-level uh, double copy trick. And we know that that works. So all the tree-level amplitudes of this double copy action, of this double copy action, are good tree level amplitudes, i.e. these theories are semi-classically semi equivalent. The physical graviton, calbramon, two form and diloton tree level amplitudes are really those of n equals zero supergravity. And this was already observed up to six points in early work. The real question is about the quantum consistency. This is meant to be some BRST gauge fixed uh, Lagrangian field theory. How do we know that there is some BRST operator that annihilates this double copy action and that is nil quadratic? The answer is the double copy BRST operator does the job. And this now requires the full off shell BRST color kinematics duality that I've been arguing for. So, whereas the semi classical equivalence just required the on shell tree level color kinematics duality of the physical S matrix, 
The quantum consistency rarely requires this full off-shell BRST color kinematics duality. So where does this double copy um, BRST operator come from? Well, recall that I, you can read off the BRST uh, action just by looking at the BV action. And then it gives me, and now if the rule is that I replace these kin, um, color structure constants with kinematic structure constants, of course, I have to do the same here. That's the rules of the game. And then in the right Yang-Mills theory, I have to do the opposite. So from the left BRST operator, I get some uh, left uh, BRST operator. And from the right BRST operator, I get some right BRST operator. And these sum together to give me the double copy operator, where in this transition, I'm just replacing these Fs with the, the color Fs with the kinematic Fs. And the short story is, is that these Yang-Mills gauge transformations it, uh, give you the diffeomorphism to form gauge symmetries, where, as I mentioned before, I'm using diffeomorphisms as the shorthand for the uh, gauge symmetries of the graviton field when you perturb around a fixed background. Now, that's, you might at this stage argue, okay, that's some uh, natural way of getting some operator, but how do I know it's nil quadratic and how do I know it uh, annihilates the action? Well, this just follows directly from the color kinematics duality. These Fs, the whole purpose of color kinematics duality was to enforce that these kinematic uh, differential operators satisfy the same identities as operator equations, as these color factors. And because uh, this was an invariance of the BRST gauge fixed action, and for a generic gauge group, it can only rest, the, the fact that it is an invariance of that action can only depend on generic properties of the structure constants. I'm not making any special statements about SUN or anything like that. These are just can only rely on generic properties. But these generic properties are obeyed by uh, these Fs just as well as these Fs. So if the original operators annihilated the original Yang Mills actions, which of course they do, then the double copy one must annihilate the double copy action. And by the same arguments, it's nil quadratic. And then I get to make this statement that I've got semi-classical equivalence, all the tree amplitudes agree. I've got some ghost sector that, uh, that I've added in that comes from the double copy of the ghost sector. And I've got a, a BRST operator that annihilates the action and is nil quadratic and I get full quantum equivalence. And I can really say that Einstein is the square of yang Mills, at least perturbatively. And you can make all of these statements explicit um, without too much computational legwork to low orders. Now, this double copy of symmetries argument that I made up here generalizes to generic symmetries as long as they don't involve the space-time coordinates explicitly. So for example, if I take a global supersymmetry, I can consider producting it with a gauge symmetry and out comes local supersymmetry. And this straightforwardly gives me a supersymmetric completion. So that brings me to uh, my penultimate section, generalizations. The basic statement is that whenever we know that color kinematics duality holds for the physical tree level S matrix, we can run all of our arguments. And so I can do, for example, the nonlinear sigma model, and that gives me the special Galileon theory. So the special Galileon is the double copy of the chiral nonlinear sigma, uh, sigma model. Uh, I can introduce fundamental coupling, so I can introduce matter fields. Um, but as I said, this is the, 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 the novelty here is that the color kinematics duality now splits into two pieces, one where I've got Jacobi identities and one where I've got commutation relations. And I can go to more exotic theories, such as the bagger lambert gustafsson theory, where rather than the Jacobi identity that involves cubic diagrams, I need to, uh, I need to enforce the uh, fundamental identity of uh, the BLG theory, which involves um, cortic vertices. So I can trade in all of the statements I was making about cubic diagrams for cortic diagrams. Cortic diagrams suddenly become the important objects. 
Um, so, sorry, I mean, the nonlinear signal model is not a gauge theory. Eh? No. So you are just using it. Uh, there's very little extension. You're just using this, uh, these, it's, this linearization, this cubicization of this. Yes. Of the structure. So in fact, the nonlinear signal model is not a generalization, it's a specialization. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, 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 and it's a specialization where I actually, much of the arguments that I needed to make for Yang Mills just disappear because I don't have to worry about a consistent BRST ghost sector. That's not an issue for the nonlinear signal model. What's interesting, uh, and I, I won't go into the story, but I, we can talk about it afterwards if you like, is that the uh, that the color kinematics duality, rather than being essential for uh, BRST invariants of the gravity theory, becomes uh, essential for um, the stability of the special Galileo. It's the color kinematics duality that's telling you that you're not getting um, uh, that that your the, the double copy theory is stable because this is ostensibly a higher derivative theory that you get out this the special Galileo and you need some special properties to ensure that it's stable and that's where the color kinematics duality is doing its hard work. But it, it's Although, also it's also not that well defined in something larger than two dimensions. So are you just restricting to two dimensions for that case? No, but I'm I'm being. Yeah. Uh, perturbative so these these are order by order perturbative state and you're and you're forgetting about renormalizability and things like that yes yeah. absolutely yeah uh, absolutely okay so maybe i can give you some idea i, I, I will try to be quick uh, uh, about how the super yang mill story i mean essentially uh, it's the same it, it's the same argument we made for the color kinematics duality of the ghosts that if you've got gluons that are related by some super symmetry by some symmetry to other fields irreducibly, then you can transfer the color kinematics duality of the gluons over onto the gluini. So whenever you have an irreducible super Yang-Mills theory, uh, you can boost the Yang-Mills color kinematics duality to the full super multiplet. And I've, I've kind of expressed this here. Um, then everything follows essentially with no new ideas. Uh, the, I suppose, to, to be very quick, if I were to consider type 1 super Yang mills in 10 dimensions, I'd get type 2A or B, depending on whether I align or anti-align the chiralities of my uh, left type 1 super Yang mills theory, my right two type 1 super Yang mills theory. So the essential thing that I do is I add into this list of fields the Gluino, and what comes out additionally are the Gravitini and the Ramon Ramon field strengths. And then this, the local super, um, the local supersymmetry of the NS Ramon sector just follows from the supersymmetry of the Yang Mills factors through this color kinematics duality argument. So where I've got some supersymmetry relating a, a gluon to a gluino, this becomes something we're relating a graviton to a gravitino, and I've got the super ghost and the Nielsen Kolosh uh, fields that all just come from the tensor products of the uh, Yang Mills BST ghost with the gluini or the Yang Mills Nakanishi Lautrop fields with the Gluini. Basically, ghost times spinner is a spinner ghost. Uh, auxiliary times spinner is an auxiliary ghost. I mean, it's exactly what you'd expect. And then you've got the Ramon Neville Schwartz sector. Slightly more interesting is the Ramon Ramon sector, where, which comes from the tensor product of the two spinner fields. And the key difference here is that in all of the other instances that I've been talking about, say if I take uh, the Yang Mills gauge potential and square it, I get the graviton, I get the potential, I don't get the field strength, I don't get the, uh, the curvature. But here I really do get the field strength. And this, I mean, there's many ways to argue why this had to be the case. Most straightforwardly is the representation theory. If I take the Majorana spinner representations of these two fields and tensor them together, I get the representations of the type 2b field strengths, not of the potentials. So just purely at a representation theoretic level, this had to be the case. But you can also see it by considering the symmetries. The BST transformations of the Gluinos have no linear contribution, which means that when I double copy this BRST operator, this object, whatever it is, cannot transform as a potential. It has no linear term. So it cannot be a potential. It must be a field strength. The final uh, intuitive argument is that the Ramon Ramon field strength couple of uh, the Ramon Ramon background fields coupled to the string world sheet through their field strengths. They don't couple through the potentials. And if you had your string open times open equals closed hat, this seems very natural. An implication of this that's less obvious is that you can rewrite the Ramon Ramon sector of type 2A or B purely in terms of the field strengths. You never see a naked 
uh, Ramon's Ramon potential. So here's an example for type 2A. There's some rewriting where you get rid of all reference to the naked Ramon's Ramon potentials. But the double copy implies a little more than this. And this little more initially was puzzling, but it turned out to be very natural in a kind of pleasing, if not fundamental way. The, the double copy demands that these Ramon Ramon field strengths should be treated as elementary fields, whose Feynman diagrams, if you treat them as elementary fields, produce Feynman diagrams that give the correct amplitudes. And that is a little unconventional. That's not normally what one would think of. In, in this formulation here, one rarely has in mind that these satisfy Bianchi identities and uh, you can reduce this to something that is the exterior derivative of a potential and then you would vary with respect to the potential to get the Feynman diagrams. Here we're not doing that and we, we're not allowed to do that by the rules of the double copy. And this is the kind of object that you get directly from double copying and it looks... Uh, unfamiliar, well, at least it did to me. I mean, maybe other people would recognize it. I've got this bi-spinner field, uh, field strength. Now, of course, I can uh, decompose this bi-spinner into a sum of regular P-form field strengths with the gamma matrices, and it gets me to something slightly more familiar. I've got an F wedge star F term, at least. And then I've got this uh, distressing non-local term here, which I can get rid of by introducing an auxiliary uh, uh, D minus P minus one P for uh, B uh, form field B. Um, and, I, uh, and I land up with this object. Now this object looks like some uh, gauged fixed uh, theory of for this B field. And indeed I can kind of undo the Feynman gauge fixing procedure and land up with something that looks a little more reasonable, although still a little unfamiliar. Now bear in mind here, this is a potential and this field strength is treated as elementary. And what we've landed on is a sense mechanism gen, uh, for realizing south dual um, field strengths in terms of one elementary propagating south dual field and an auxiliary uh, potential that decouples from the system. And we see that the double copy gives us that automatically. Now, the, the, the reason that Sen introduced this was to be able to describe South Dual fields, so this term would vanish. And then what you'd be left with is exactly what the action that Sen wrote down. We see that this is just a generalization where you don't necessarily have to have a South Dual field. And this mechanism was motivated by type 2b string theory, where the Ramon Ramon sector is naturally given in terms of bias spinners. And you can think of this as just being the double copy shadow of that statement. Okay. Um, if you've got the patience, I can tell you about the homotopy double copy, or we can stop there and I can we can take questions and I can tell you about this in a more informal setting. Well, what do you think, Denjo? Um, I should, I'm always willing to go longer, so I should ask probably others if they have to rush away. The advantage you see is that it, there's a recording and that if somebody wants to leave, they should feel free to leave because they can always catch the end of it. Okay. Later, and I, so I, I, my, I tend to go along with these things, but uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to go into depth in this. But I mean, we, I, I realize that we have silenced the audience, so it's uh... <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe raise your hat. I mean, you just leave the room if you don't want to stay. I won't be offended. <laughs> I certainly won't be offended. I've gone way over time, so there is, you know. Oh, I, 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 I have a question. Uh, so, um, maybe, so, go ahead. Ah, yeah. So I was wondering. So in the Young Mills theory, so when uh, if you have the CP strong, uh, I mean, if you have the theta term, because I have a minus CP strong theorem, okay, mm. there is a way to have uh, uh, the gravitational uh, theory, you know, with something that breaks parity and charge conjugation somehow. Um, the, the short answer is no. Uh, I mean, that, that's a non-perturbative. Um, uh, yeah, sure. that's, that's a non-perturbative uh, setup, and I don't directly know how to handle it. The, the slightly longer story is that people have actually considered this, and 
that I mentioned that you have this classical, non-perturbative classical double copy, which doesn't really work in the way I've been describing. It's, it's, uh, it's a double copy of classical solutions. And the claim is there is that you can take, for example, uh, the double copy of S-duality and it will give you some gravitational analog of that. And I think the uh, rough consensus is that it corresponds to the Ehlers symmetry of gravity, which only becomes manifest when you dimensionally reduce the three dimensions. So there is some uh, tentative notion that you can get from uh, S-duality to Ehlers symmetry. There is also uh, relations relating monopoles in Yang-Mills to uh, gravitational instantons in this kind of uh, non-perturbative setting. But I don't want to speak on behalf of that work because I'm not familiar enough with it to be sure that I'm properly representing those statements. Um, but that's the kind of rough intuition. Perturbatively, in this amplitude picture, I have nothing to say. Okay, um, in this non-perturbative picture, you can try to say something, but I'm not 100% clear on what the answers are personally. Okay, thank you. I have some... Uh... By the way, it is a fascinating talk. There are too many things I don't know. Okay? Very nice. Okay? So my first question is, you, got, you have written on the action repeatedly. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I'm listening. Ah, so I suppose I look at equations of motion. Okay? Are they globally hyperbolic? There are all kinds of things like square root or delta and so on. No? It doesn't look like uh, you have pseudo differential operators in the action. Yes. So what, happens have... causality? what happens to causality? So the, um, the final cubic action will be completely local, but you're right, these, in these intermediate steps where we introduce these vertices, that patch up thing for the amplitudes, I had one over box operators. And uh, there are many ways you can think of how that should be more precisely articulated. I mean, the, the level of the amplitudes, they're just inserting propagators over propagators in the appropriate way. But, you know, you want to extend the, uh, you want to split the field space um, into Schwartz parts and uh, uh, propagating parts with uh, compactly supported Cauchy data. Uh, and in, in, in that case, I think everything, I mean, bear in mind, we're just in flat space. Um, then yes, everything is uh, uh, as one would expect it to be. So the related question is, the structure constants, small f, i, j, k, mm -hmm. one index is upstairs and the other two indices are downstairs. Yes. Normally one can form a, one can take, multiply two of them and we get a metric, some object with two upper indices. Mm. And if that is non-degenerate, you have a semi-simple algebra. And if you lower the uh, upstairs index of small f, and it is totally anti-symmetric, you have a compact Lie algebra. That's a mm -hmm. standard result. What happens here with the stuff you are getting with capital F? So um, you can use, in, 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 in special gauges, one can orchestrate that the Cij's are um, invertible, and they raise and lower the indices on the f's in the way you'd expect. Huh. Do they um, give you totally anti-symmetry objects for the uh, compactly algebra? You get totally anti. You get epsilon i j k, for example. For yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. For your group, for your object, for uh, gravity. Yes. So you, you. Yes, it's totally anti-symmetric. Yeah. It is totally anti-symmetric. Okay. So again, I come back to causality. Mm. Uh, there is a perturbative causality condition, this uh, condition of Epstein Glasser and Bogolyubov and so forth. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Which is, in fact, they generate the perturbation series by causality, uh, causality requirements. Sorry, can you just repeat the first part of that sentence? Okay. Uh, causality can be formulated in causal perturbation theory of Bogolyubov and Epstein Glasser. Okay. Uh, there is a precise. So, that somehow reflects the fact that the underlying classical theory is causal. Okay? But in any case, this is a quantum causality condition. And the question I'm asking is, at least this is not obvious to me, that 
the perturbation series you are generating is causal. That's yes. Mm. So the the it, it will be, um, and the most direct way to argue that is to just appeal to the semi-classical equivalence of the tree level amplitudes. The fact that we've got, and I didn't show you this, but that the uh, kinematic parts of the Lagrangians are related by a invertible uh, local field redefinition, which together implies that there are some field redefinitions that just take my action uh, that, that I've generated by the double copy and turn it into precisely the standard Einstein-Hilbert action, perturbatively expanded around Minkowski space-time. Uh, Einstein-Hilbert plus calvin mondin dilaton So there, there, there exist field redefinitions um, that relate my two actions. Now, the, the, the caveat, and this comes from these counter terms, is that the resulting thing will be, uh, an, the details of this are, I, I'm not going to be able to convey full transparency, but the, the intuition is that when I do these uh, local field redefinitions, I'm going to be left with non-local terms. And they're going to exist, they are guaranteed to exist, non-local field redefinitions, which precisely move, remove those non-local terms. And they will precisely cancel the Jacobian counter terms that I got. So the short answer is, we, uh, we are assured that the theory is equivalent in every sense to the standard formulation by the fact that there is a good set of field redefinitions that relate the two formulations. And, and, and that, that's, that's uh, the strongest statement I could make in that regard. Hmm. Uh, let me again ask a slightly related question. You have two groups, I mean, two algebraic structures. One is the gate group algebraic structures, and then you have the diffuse, okay, whatever they are. Okay. And one acts on the other. Diffuse acts on the uh, uh, connection forms, okay, but not other, not necessarily the other, other way around. Mm. So we have one uh, algebraic, apparently, let me say, one algebraic structure acting on another algebraic structure, and this creates a thing. It's called a double. What is it called? The, the half algebraic structure. No, uh, there's a cross product of these algebras. Are we, are we just to, just for just to make sure that I'm on the same page as you? Are we talking about um, the graviton and Kalbermann two form, and the the fact that the diffeos acts on the two form symmetries in in the natural way, and that conspires to give you a uh, a two group structure? Hmm. No, the uh, diffeos also act on the connection forms of the gauge theory. Yes, okay, I, so I, I see. Um, yes, I also have the diffeomorphisms of the young Mills gauge theory itself. Uh, sure, every theory. Uh, so there's time. a cross product of the two. If there is, I don't know what algebraic structure is. This one, mm. Mm. I think that if I were to define diffuse a la Alain Kuhn, okay, they will be related to the internal diffuse or the algebraic structure. Of algebraic function of uh, compactly supported functions, okay? let us say on a manifold, okay? uh, and that acts on the uh, uh, algebra structure underlying the gauge group. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you have a cross product of these two algebras, and that is a half algebra canonically. Okay. I'm wondering whether the various uh, structures you are writing, these composing two theories, are related to this kind of cross product of algebras of half, half algebras and their co-products. There, there is a natural way of composing things. Okay? Mm. Yes. Um, I do see what you're getting at. And I, I suppose in this, what, what is a little unclear to me is that I want to, you know, I, if, if I want to realize what's realized at the level of the amplitudes, I want to um, uh, destroy all traces of the gauge groups that I started out with. I mean, the, 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 the gravitational theories do not know about those gauge groups. So, but, in, but I can still see that there might be something in what you're saying that I've got the diffios acting on the, uh, on the, on the gauge group structure uh, in the natural way. 
And then I get the crop. If if that's the case for both theories, there should be some uh, conspiracy amongst these two sets of diffios acting on the on the gauge groups, where somehow I've got to understand how I take the gauge groups out of that. I I I, I, I can see what you're getting at, but I don't have anything clear to say. But I, I, yeah, maybe there's something in that idea. One more spot question, then I'll stop. You did not talk about renormalization. Actually, doing the renormalization renormalization of this perturbation series. Mm. Now, there is a uh, half algebraic structure which comes in the cone crimer approach mm. to renormalization. Is yeah. there any relation? Have you studied renormalization? We actually, uh, well, I began with the homotopy algebra stories precisely in the context of the cone crimer. Um, Hopf algebras and renormalization, and then abandoned that project in favor of things where I knew how to make a bit more progress. Um, but it has been in the back of my mind that at some point I should revisit that picture and try to tie these things together. Um, I don't have an immediate uh, intuition of how one ought to do this, but it has been something that has been on the back burner. Uh, to some degree so uh yeah I, I i wouldn't want to say that there's something to it because i just don't know at this stage okay okay that's it okay so um in the spirit of never ending i will continue <laughs> and uh go on to this is i promise the final section and i'll make it relatively short so i thought i should just say quickly what a homotopy algebra is and how they're connected to bv lagrangian field theories so uh, homotopy algebras generalize your favorite algebras, matrix, Li, whatever you have in mind, to include higher products satisfying higher relations up to homotopies. So the standard one that one meets in uh, homotopy algebras 101 is the homotopy relaxation of Li algebras, which go by various names, homotopy Li algebras or L infinity algebras. And the idea is here that while a Lie algebra has a, a, a degree zero, a grade zero vector space, and on it some Lie bracket that satisfies some relations, anti-symmetry and Jacobi, an L infinity algebra has a graded vector space, a tower of higher brackets. So I've got a unary, I've got the familiar binary bracket, I've got ternary and, and so on up the tower that satisfy anti-symmetry relations, now graded anti-symmetry relations. And rather than Jacobi identities, homotopy Jacobi identities, where the homotopy relations are given by the higher product. So the Jacobi identity for the binary bracket may fail up to term and terms that are determined by the ternary bracket and the unary bracket, uh, and so on. Uh, and you can play this game for your favorite algebras. One of the earliest examples are the homotopy relaxation of associative algebras, where you relax the associativity conditions. These give you A infinity algebras. You can do the same for commutative algebras, which give you C infinity algebras. And there are many examples now. Is there a nice graphical way of representing those? Just like the Jacobi identity is often represented graphically. Yes, there is. There's a whole mathematical um, framework for doing exactly that. It goes by the name of operats. Um, so you can think of operats. Exactly. Yes, we had a, a post up here who was into that type of thing. He's a um, he's a trinity. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, you remember. Um, so that's in Right. Yes. Right. Um, oh, yeah. No. In fact, uh, I've landed up having to read his work which has been a, a, a joy. I made that sound like a, 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 a negative thing, but I've actually- No, he's uh, very good, yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I, I, I'm really enjoying that subject. I think it's, it, it's a beautiful story. It's uh, perhaps a little long to go into now, but the intuition in operators is basically you have, um, rather than considering the algebras themselves, you consider, uh, you can think of it as just having uh, diagrams where you have n inputs and one output, and you can plug these diagrams into each other to generate you know, nested uh, algebra relations, and they satisfy certain properties amongst them that are shared in very natural ways. It actually is very natural. You're talking um, about planar algebras, am I right? Sorry? You're talking about planar algebras. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. What, what does planar mean in this context? This, this structure you are telling me, 
of mm. taking uh, uh, putting one algebra into the other there you have this exactly what the uh, is done in planar algebras and uh, the associated theory of subfactors I, I think they're slightly more general than that actually but you don't need an algebra yes they're, uh, they're an operand yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, yeah the operand comes out of the fact that there is an action of so you have a disk and lot of disks inside okay mm, you yes. give it an algebraic so if you take uh, something another one of these things there is a way of inserting one into the other and this gives a certain action of the second one on the first which yes. is i think called an operand okay in that context okay? and then it, uh, very rapidly we seem to theory of uh, subfactors in how phenomena algebra this is what i uh, i have been trying to study okay it looks your word suggests this structure this is due okay. to um, uh, the person, the maths guy who died recently um, joe bon jones jones yeah yes uh, jones, okay yeah. Uh, yeah. jones, no he's he's important in this whole story so i, I suspect yeah. we're circling around the same same objects yeah. um so to 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 connect these homotopy algebras to BV Lagrangian field theories, it's it's nice to go to the Chevalier Eilenberg formulation. So uh, we could do this for a Lie algebra first to give you some idea. Um, I just take the uh, I take some Lie algebra G, and to form its Chevalier uh, Eilenberg formulation, I grade shift it. That's what this uh, parentheses one means. So I, I give it degree minus one. And then I take its dual. So now it's got degree one. And then I form the uh, reduced free tensor algebra over that. And uh, on that, I have some differential Q. And the most general thing I can write down for the action of this differential, so a differential is a degree one object. And, and given that I've only got these degree one generators, I should get something degree two. And the most generic thing I can write is this. Because of the, the grading, this is anti-symmetric in B and C. And then the nil quadricity just gives me the Jacobi relation. So it's just another way of articulating what a Lie algebra is. But I can play exactly the same game for the homotopy relaxation of Lie algebras. I just plug in the grade shifted dualized L infinity algebra into its uh, reduced uh, free tensor algebra. Rather than having these structure constants, I've got these generic uh, all order structure constants, which are just the coefficients of the uh, higher brackets. And then the Q squared equals zero condition are the homotopy Jacobi relations. And the point of this story is that in this picture, it's quite quick to relate this Q to the uh, BV operator uh, of some L infinity algebra. So this is the quickest route to, to relating a BV field theory to an L infinity algebra. And here's Yang Mills as an example. So I've given the uh, I've given the uh, unary part of the differential um, uh, along the arrows, and these are my various degrees that enter this L infinity algebra. And then there's a whole formula, given this L infinity algebra for Yang Mills, I can consider its homotopy Maurer Cartan theory, and this gives me the field strengths and gauge transformations. The Cartan killing form of the Lie algebra gets generalized to a, a cyclic structure on the L infinity algebra, and this gives me the BV action. So I just consider the cyclic structure um on some uh this is generically some super field that's bundled all of these fields together into a degree one object and uh all of the higher products all of the higher brackets acting on this gives me the bv action and then i've got these statements uh, about the equivalence of l infinity algebras and their relationship to physical equivalence that's mediated by this relationship between the BV action and the L infinity algebra. So we regard two L infinity algebras as quasi isomorphic if they're isomorphic on their cohomologies. And this intuitively relates to the physical equivalence because physical equivalence is really about the cohomology of the uh, BV complex. And there are two powerful theorems. One is this strictification theorem that says if I have any L infinity algebra, it's quasi isomorphic to one that only has non trivial higher brackets for the unary and binary bracket, i.e., it's a DG Lie algebra, it's a graded differential Lie algebra. And this intuitively is relating some theory that has arbitrary order interactions to something that's just cubic. Because if I only have a unary and binary uh, bracket, 
I only get uh, quadratic and cubic interactions in this BV interaction. But actually, this is hiding some uh, technicalities. Really, if one uses the abstract strictification theorem, generically, this would be highly non-local and you'll have to go to loop space. And there's a, there's a story associated with that rather than just introducing auxiliary fields. Um, there's also a minimal model theorem that says that every L infinity algebra is quasi isomorphic to one where the unary operator is zero. And then all the higher products correspond to the tree scattering amplitudes. That's their, that becomes their role in life. Um, okay, so this Yang Mills uh, L infinity algebra, it factorizes into three pieces. There's the color Lie algebra, which is trivially an L infinity algebra. I've got this kinematic piece, which on its own doesn't have its own intrinsic algebraic structure. It's a it's the representation space of Poincaré representations of all my auxiliary fields I introduced. But it combines with a scalar field theory uh, factor to give a C infinity algebra. And this is uh, something we uh, established really for a twisted tensor product. I won't go into that. So I've just said that here. So for example, I've got the uh, graded Poincaré uh, representations of the ghosts, the gluon, the nakanishi laotrop field, the anti-ghosts, and all the auxiliaries going up. And then the acyclic structure factors amongst these three factors in an obvious manner. Now, this is all very nice. And we had some uh, homotopy. This gives us a homotopy algebra realization of color kinematics duality. It's really encoded in this twisted tensor product. Um, but one can do better. And this is really remarkable work by Mikhail Reiterer that's gone slightly underappreciated, I would say. And he used something called a BV box infinity algebra, which he introduced himself, to prove the on-shell tree-level color kinematics duality for physical gluons. So there is some intuition that color kinematics duality really corresponds to a homotopy algebra. And the, the basic takeaway picture that I'd like to impress on you is that naively the kinematic Jacobi identities fail, but they're always only failing up to homotopy. So uh, these, uh, the, the fact that we can patch up the kinematic Jacobi identities to hold exactly corresponds to the fact that they only ever failed up to homotopy. This relied on the existence of a particular unary map, which he called H, on the zaitlin costello BV complex for Yang Mills, which just corresponds to a first order formulation with a gauge potential and a self dual uh, two form field strength that satisfies these rather familiar. Uh, conditions where D is the standard exterior derivative. This looks like H should just be the adjoint to D, uh, but it's not in this case. It breaks Lorentz invariance, in fact. But what Reiter approved is that H exists. It's what's called a second order derivation up to homotopy. And the implications of these statements is that there is a BV box infinity algebra structure on this complex. And that on shell tree level color kinematics duality holds for physical gluons. This is all very nice, and I think it uh, opens the door uh, to some uh, improvements. Um, it, I mean, for one thing, it's a very novel way of proving the tree level on shell physical color kinematics duality in an intuitive way, I would say. But it's very special. You can only do it in D equals four, and it's got no loop uh, disradata. So the ghost and gauge fixing considerations are not included here. And you're stuck in D equals four because you want to use this specific complex to prove these statements. And this complex only really makes sense in four dimensions. And it's also a little mysterious. So when Reiter articulated what this BV box infinity algebra is, you could see it was a generalization of the uh, famous BV infinity algebras, which are homotopy BV algebras, where you have to impose this uh, seven term identity. Now, this seven term identity was just seen to be needed for the consistency of the whole construction and for the proofs of color kinematics duality to go through. But it was kind of plucked out from the genius of writer. It didn't appear in any transparent, obvious way to us at least. So, is it possible to see where the four restriction to four dimensions comes from? Yes, it's the self duality of this. Uh, oh, okay. Of the two form. Um, so this, this made us think that this should be the, uh, the nuggets of some kind of larger structure that would enlarge this picture to something completely generic and where 
some of the mysterious properties should become self-evident. And indeed, that's the case. So you can take our BST Lagrangian formulation and you can take these two terms, the kinematic and the scalar terms, and show that what color kinematics duality means in this context is that this, these factors are not just any odd uh, C infinity algebra, they're in fact what's called a BV box algebra, uh, a, a term that we introduced, but you can find it in early work, essentially find it in early work of Getzler. Um, and this BV box algebra comes with two products. It comes with a C infinity product. And this product essentially is the product that gives us the cubic interactions and a, uh, quad, uh, a quadratic product that forms a, 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 would form a DG Lie algebra if it were not for this box. And here we see that these operators D and H satisfy these uh, natural conditions. And I still have this hodge de ram like uh, uh, relationship to the Laplacian. Um, and we would like to take this structure and relax it to a homotopy algebra and see what comes out. But there is a subtlety. When you are given an algebra, it's important you specify what the ambient category is in which you do its homotopy relaxation. Um, and in the usual category one, so you would think because, because um, this corresponds to a chain complex, the, 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 the immediate thing one would think to do was to consider the category of chain complexes. But in this case, D is privileged over H. D is a part of the structure of the ambient uh, category, whereas H is part of the structure of the operat, if you like, if you want to think operatically. Um, but we can put them on an equal footing by introducing the notion of a symmetric monoidal category of Hodge complexes, which roughly speaking are modules over twisted Hopf algebras with some central element. Um, and the central element, so the, 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 the uh, paradigmatic example to have in mind to kind of locate what some of these terms means is the Hopf algebra of constant differential operators. And this is the Laplacian, which is a, a, a central element in that Hopf algebra, where we impose these identities. And then it turns out that co-associativity of the co-product in this Hopf algebra is precisely this seven term identity. So the seven dot term identity suddenly becomes something that was completely natural and it just had to be there. Um, and in this context, both D and H are part of the ambient structure. So neither of them are homotopy relaxed. They sit on an equal footing. And we get something called, that we call the BV box infinity over Hodge uh, algebra. And this over Hodge is just to remind us that we're doing the homotopy relaxation in the context of this category of Hodge complexes rather than chain complexes. And what all of this corresponds to is integrating out all of the auxiliary fields that we introduced to make the action cubic. So the physical intuition is actually completely transparent. And then it turns out that the homotopy relations of this algebra are just the kinematic Jacobi relations. And it offers a route to computational efficiency. First of all, I only ever need to do tree level calculations. And all of the hard work is in uh, satisfying color kinematic duality for loops. There you get typically one uh, uses ANSAT say that grow uh, super exponentially. But here we just use tree calculations. And in fact, because we've got the, the axiomatic structure of this BV box infinity algebra, we can reduce all of the work to, to satisfying a single identity at every order because everything else just follows axiomatically once we're given the axioms of this algebra. Um, essentially, one has to solve an identity that looks of the form at endpoints. If you're considering color kinematics duality at endpoints, that you have an endpoint tree with one enary vertex and you just want to decompose it into endpoint trees with two internal vertices. Uh, on the downside, we have to work with Feynman diagrams, and the ultimate goal would be to marry this with the on shell methods, kind of put these two approaches together for uh, real efficiency. Okay, so this is my final slide. Uh, I'm just going to mention that one can generalize this to ADS backgrounds, or at least it seems very possible to do so. Um, and the key idea here, from our point of view, is to replace the Hopf algebra of constant differential operators 
um, constant coefficient differential operators with the algebra of the universal enveloping algebra of the ADS isometries. As I mentioned before, we can consider things that are not centered around cubic diagrams, but have uh, uh, are centered around uh, cortic uh, diagrams. Uh, and this corresponds to uh, generalizing the BV box operat to an Emery operat. So in the Bagger Lambert Gustafson case, we'd have a quaternary operat. Uh, matter couplings in this context correspond to many sorted operats. And uh, tentatively, it seems like we can push these things onto string theory, where box now becomes the Viosora operator. And it looks like we might get some glimpses of color kinematic duality for strings. Um, and I think I will leave it there, given how dramatically over time I am. Thank you for your patience. Well, thank you very much. It was um, a tour de force, indeed. Uh, but I totally enjoyed that. Uh, um, there probably are questions left. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask, is there a renormalization theory underlying this? What is the rule for renormalization? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so uh, I don't think we yet are in a position to make a clear statement about that. So I how does one compare diagrams? Suppose I have some loop diagram coming from gravity side and the other side gauge series. How does one compare them without renormalization? Yes, so the comparison isn't straightforward because in this double copy procedure, one changes the power counting rules. Essentially, you double the, you always double the momenta in the numerators. So things get worse is the general principle. Yes. Um, you know, when you go from gauge theory to gravity, things get worse. They get worse in precisely the way they ought to. And I guess that's part of why these uh, miracle-like cancellations are, are compelling because although things ought to be getting worse, you see in places that they just don't. Um, mm. You should get a divergence and you don't. And that's suggestive. On, uh, you could actually turn this around. I, I alluded to this N equals five example. And I said, ah, oh, look, at N equal, for N equals five supergravity, you, get, you, you see that there are no divergences where there really should be divergences. Everything is telling you it should diverge at that loop order and it doesn't. And you say, well, maybe something special is going on, but it's something special in N equals five supergravity. And I don't think anyone would argue that N equals five supergravity is going to be perturbatively finite. Um, so these special things can happen in places where one wouldn't necessarily expect them to uh, get you to perturbative finiteness. So okay, you could use that to argue that it's not going to work for N equals eight. I, I, I just think it's too early to make any definitive statements. I, I, and I know in the in the community <coughs> where they re really do the hard work and you know the real calculations that get you these answers uh, they would quite correctly say that we have to do the calculation to, to get a better intuition of what's going on and i think i would agree with that it would be nice to think that there is some way of coming at it from a more uh, algebraic or abstract point of view to get a handle on this but i don't think we're quite at that stage yet the closest we could possibly get to it, perhaps moving to string theory. And, and I, I think, uh, Laurent, if I might interrupt, the place to start is probably the nonlinear sigma model that you wrote. Yes. Because so, the three dimensional nonlinear sigma model is non perturbatively renormalizable. Right. Not perturbatively. So there's possibly a secret lying in there. If you Do you know what, what the statements would be about for, for special Galileans yeah. in three dimensions? I suppose three dimensions becomes problematic because the gravity is, to, well, at least for gravity, it's topological and all the degrees of freedom are carried by the fields that gravity couples to. Um, so if I were to double copy Yang Mills in three dimensions, I get propagating degrees of freedom because of course Yang Mills has propagating degrees of freedom. But they're all in the uh, matter sector. They're not in the in, 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 uh, in, they're not in the gravity sector. All the degrees of freedom are carried by scalar fields and fermions, and the and the, and the graviton doesn't carry any propagating degrees of freedom. It just mediates the interactions. So I'm not sure. Although uh, having non-perturbative renormalizability for 
the nonlinear signal model. I don't know what that means for its double copy. I mean, it's a good place to start uh, trying to ask those questions. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I... Okay. Can you make a couple of remarks? First is... let, let, let's give Ian a chance. Just. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, Ian. Uh, um, can you hear me now? Yes. You can um, probably take your mask off to speak because it's uh, yeah. it's there very muffled. In the last one over there as well, but yeah, uh, we're uh, yeah. I want to ask uh, just a I guess a simple question because I wasn't able to follow everything, but um, how does this fit in with the whole convolution stuff? The part that you yes. were working. Something to change there in terms of high order. I don't know. Yeah. So the so um, I wish better to say uh, I have some speculations, um, and the, the if you were so this 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 way of generating the gravity theory from the gauge theory is uh, crystal clear at the level of the scattering amplitudes and. At the level, in the terms of this Lagrangian double copy, it was a rule for getting new theories, not the old theories. But if you were talking about solutions or the equations of motion of the old to the equations of motion of the old theory, and how to get solutions to equations of motion to the of the new theory, aside from reconstructing them perturbatively from the tree scattering amplitudes, uh, there is no clear. This rule doesn't make any clear statement about it. I just tensor the um, the uh, uh, vector spaces, the, the, the field spaces together, and then consider the fields in those in those tensor products. But it doesn't tell me how I take a particular solution and turn it into another solution. And that's probably where the convolution could enter, right? The convolution really says, if I have a solution in this theory, uh, uh, in the left theory and a solution in the right theory, I can convolve to get a solution that ought to be a solution of the uh, double copy theory. Um, and now that's certainly true at the uh, uh, quadratic level, but that's a little too trivial. It, but what might be tempting is to put these two pictures together where the double copy rule uh, that I've expressed today works as it works. But when you want to know what is H mu nu in terms of A mu and A nu, then you have to use the convolution. Um, and th th there, is, there are some simple things that one needs to check to see if that has any mileage. I haven't checked them, but maybe we could check them. If you <laughs> I mean, uh, we could look at that and see if it, see if it works. Uh, thanks for the question though. I wanted to make one small remark. Okay. That the nonlinear sigma models, normally they are formulated as G, G over H models. That is some group G is acting in its part. That can be written as a uh, gauge theory, okay? Where the gauge group is, group of maps into the H that remains, okay? And one can write a canonical connection and write a gauge theory. So very likely all that you have said will apply there. You don't need to, you don't need local coordinates. So one can write it globally, okay? Um, okay, that's just a remark. Second remark is, um, this operands. Well, I, I should have said more clearly. There is this stuff called planar tangles. Okay. Planar tangles is the starting point of pl pl uh, this planar algebras. So, uh, pl planar tangle is simply a, a disk with a lot of disks inside and curves going inside and so forth, which is what Jones started from. And from there, he constructed this algebraic structure which has now gone deeply into subfactor theory of Fordham type two subfactor theory, okay? which comes in and is not invariance. So that was my interest. I wanted to know how it's entering the physics. Then found this beautiful theory of um, operats, which is lying there. Okay? Just a, a remark. Last question is, it's not clear to me that this whole thing is causal. I mean, it's not clear, I mean, uh, it doesn't seem epstein glasser renormalization depends upon causality. It's not a question of integrating our fields. Okay? There is an intrinsic statement about or Bogolubov, Bogolubov's uh, formulation of causality in S matrix. Okay? 
it is not clear because there are all kinds of non local operations going on just a remark i don't know okay maybe one should uh, check out what is happening hmm. i suppose i suppose the um the up to renormalization and of course you know how one chooses to renormalize particularly in gravity where it's ambiguous um due to its non-renormalizability uh is a you know that the, the the structure of things is dependent on the choices one makes but leaving leaving that aside the thing that i would say is that the s matrices uh unregularized are um identical to standard gravity now the point is, is that there is a choice of regularization so let's say let's say you make a, a choice in for your standard action uh, so so what i want to start with is standard einstein hilbert standard n equals 0 supergravity uh, i'm going to do some uh, well i tree there's nothing to talk about everything just matches at tree level perfectly but i'm going to consider some loops and i'm going to pick some uh, regularization scheme and uh, renormalization scheme and if i make that choice for the standard n equals zero supergravity there is a canonical map that takes you in, in the double copy theory that we're asking whether it's equivalent there is a map that takes you to a uh, regularization and renormalization scheme um, that is exactly equivalent. It won't be identical, but there, 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 is a, there is a correspondence. I can take, I can make whatever choice I like in the uh, canonical gravitation, the canonical formulation of gravity, and I can transfer it over to some other choice for the double copy formulation such that the answers will always agree. And this is something we can guarantee for you. Um, so even given the vagaries of renormalization for re non-renormalizable theories, we can order by order match things up. So whatever is true for the standard formulation of n equals zero supergravity is true for the double copy derived formulation of n equals zero supergravity. Um, at least that's the intuition. Mm. Okay. Can I ask, has anyone thought of this, looked at what's going on in this double copy formulation from a uh, Hamiltonian point of view? I mean, what the double copy suggests, uh, as you began with, that I take two, the tensor product of the Hilbert spaces of the two theories, and you're projecting in some sense onto a sector of, uh, of uh, what in your uh, in one of your diagrams you showed us uh, that you could get four ways of doing it, mm. and but presumably the full theory, full thing that you would get would be uh, some direct sum of the four and maybe some with some possible cross terms between them. But you're projecting out onto one of them in by picking out you, some recipe. Uh, from, uh, from this, but it'd be very interesting to see if one could understand what's going on and from a Hamiltonian point of view. Or yeah, that... so the, 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 the immediate, um, I, I see what you're getting. I, I, I don't see how you'd get the sum of all four because in this, so the, you, you imagine factorizing your Hilbert space into a tensor product of two terms. So color and fields. Uh, with color no, no, well, I was, I was thinking of taking the Hilbert space directly and I physically, uh, as a Bobo's point of there were some people even doing experiments trying to have double photons together. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to have two gluons uh, together, just very much like Feynman and, uh, and those guys were envisaging. You take a tensor product of two copies of your um, mm -hmm. of your original theory, and now you start you say, well, what? How does it break up into uh, into something? There should be something like the graviton in there. There's a problem with non-locality, but 
these things one should look at more carefully. Maybe there are loopholes there. Yeah, okay. so that, like, that is the, the, maybe the first quick comment is that if you imagine doing that, so you've got, say, two, you just do Yang Mills times Yang Mills for simplicity's sake. Then if you just take the tensor product of everything, you get uh, gauge Lie algebra left, tensor gauge Lie algebra right, tensor field space left, tensor field space right. And you get a doubling of the uh, gauge Lie algebras rather than getting rid of them. So what I was doing was not, I wasn't tensoring them together. I was stripping one factor away and putting in another factor and, and replacing it with another factor. So it wasn't really- I, I can see that, but it-, but it, it, it but, but I, I wanted to I wanted to say that that's not an empty that's not an empty idea. In fact, um, Andrew Hodges uh, articulated things in that way early on in this story. He was in, in the context of twister theory, of course. But the his statement was that the uh, product of two gluon amplitudes isn't really just gravity; it's gravity. Uh, times some biojoint scalar field theory. And you can see in very concrete sense that that comes out. Now, in that picture where you just take the full uh, Hilbert space of... Um, I, I think you're taking, uh, I think you're taking the field theory space rather than the quantum structure. But you're, I'm thinking of the, uh, the Hilbert space in, in a Hamiltonian formulation, whereas mm -hmm. you look like you're, tense, you're taking the tensor product of something much larger than this. Can I suggest for point of something? One takes, suppose you take an algebra even in quantum mechanics. So algebra of all functions along with their momenta on R3. Okay? It is a certain, let's say, set of operators of all bounded operators on a Hilbert space. Okay? In general, you cannot define a map from B of H as an isomorphism from B of H to B of H cross B of H. But it doesn't exist unless the B of H is a half algebra, okay? And so that brings back to the question I was asking before, okay? So if you want to compose systems like this, one needs a half algebra structure, I think. Okay? Yes. Yeah. In and fact, then, we, we, we use that observation when we double copy in the, um, in the context of the BV box algebra. It's the fact that, precisely the fact that we've, we're considering uh, modules over this Hopf algebra is needed. Well, first of all, it's needed to make this into a symmetric model, monoidal category. The tensor product structure relies on the Hopf algebra uh, structure. Um, okay. So yeah, I, I agree. And then that, how crucial was that for the double copy in the BV, BV box algebra picture? Um, no, there we tensor producted over the uh, over the ring uh, uh, rather than over the hop algebra underlying hop algebra. So there it wasn't essential. But here we want to tensor over the underlying hop algebra. Sorry, uh, I just want to say thanks again. Uh, I've got to run. Uh, okay. I see you all. Cheers. Nice Cheers. Hello. Uh, we, I don't think we can hear you, Denjo. You're, you're muted. I forgot, I forgot to unmute myself. I'm going to stop the recording as well, sorry. Okay. Uh, I think we've, sure. we've over two hours of a recording, so that's probably long enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much. No, I'm sorry I made it so long. No, 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 not at all. You didn't make it long. We, are, we were the, it was the entrance from the audience. Yes. That's fascinating talk. There are too many things to learn. Okay. Yeah, there's um, oh. there's too much to convey. I